Welcome to this CUBE conversation. I'm Dave Nicholson, and this is part of the AWS Startup Showcase Season 2. I'm very happy to have with me Webb Brown, CEO of KubeCost. Webb, welcome to the program. How are you? I'm doing great. It's great to be here, Dave. Thank you so much for having me. Really excited yeah. for the discussion. Good to see you. I guess we saw each other last uh, down in Los Angeles for, uh, for KubeCon, right? Exactly right. Uh, still feeling the energy from that event, hoping we can be back together in person uh, not, not too long from now. Yeah, well, I'll second that. Well, let, let's get straight to it. Tell us, tell us about KubeCost. What do you guys do? Uh, and I think just central to that question is, what gives you guys the right to exist? What problems are you solving? Yeah, I love the question. Uh, so first and foremost, KubeCost, we provide uh, cost monitoring and cost management solutions for teams running Kubernetes or cloud native workloads. Uh, everything we do is, is built on open source. Our founding team was uh, working on infrastructure monitoring solutions at, at Google before this. Um, and, and what we saw was as we had several teammates join the Kubernetes effort very early days at, at Google, uh, we saw teams really struggling even just to, to monitor and understand Kubernetes costs, right? There's lots of complexity with the Kubernetes scheduler and being able to answer the question of what is the cost of an application or, or what is the cost of you know, a team department, et cetera, and the, the workloads that they're deploying um, was really hard for most teams. Uh, if you look at CNCF study from uh, you know, late last year, still today, about two thirds of teams can't answer where they are spending money. Um, and what we saw when digging in there is that when you can't answer that question, it's really hard to, to be efficient. And by be efficient, we, uh, we mean get the right balance between cost and performance and reliability. Um, so we uh, help teams in, in these areas and, and more. Um, we're, you know, now have thousands of teams using our product. Um, you know, we feel we're, we're just getting started on our mission as well. So when people hear, when people think of kube cost, they, they naturally associate that with Kubernetes and they think, well, Kubernetes is open source. Wait, isn't that free? So, so what costs are you tracking exactly? Yeah, great question. We would track cost uh, in any environment where you can run Kubernetes. Um, so if that's on-prem, uh, you can bring a custom pricing sheet to monitor, say, the cost of your underlying uh, CPU cores, you know, GPUs, memory, et cetera. If you're running in a cloud environment, we have integrations with Azure GCP and AWS where we would be able to reflect all the complexity of you know, whatever deployment you have, whether you're using you know, spot in multiple regions, where you have complex you know, enterprise discounts, RIs, savings plans, you name it, we'd be reflecting it. Um, so it's really about you know, not just generic prices, uh, it's about getting the right price um, for your organization. So the infrastructure that goes into this calculation uh, can be on-premises or off-premises in the form of cloud. I, I heard that right? Yeah, that's exactly right. So all of those environments, we'd give you uh, visibility into all the resources that your Kubernetes clusters are consuming. Again, that's you know nodes, load balancers, every resource that it's you know directly touching. Also have the ability for you to pull in external costs, right? So if you have Kubernetes tenants that are using S3 or Cloud SQL or you know another external cloud service, we would make that connection for you. And then lastly, if you have shared costs, sometimes even like the cost of a DevOps team, we'd give you the ability to kind of allocate that back to your core infrastructure, which may be used for showback or even chargeback across your, your organization. So who are the folks in an organization that are tapping into this? Uh, are these, you know, are, are, are developers being encouraged to be cognizant of these costs? Uh, throughout the process, or is this just sort of a CFO on down visibility tool? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. And what we see is a major transformation here uh, where, you know, kind of shift left from a cost perspective where more and more engineering teams are interested in, in just being aware or having transparency 
so they can build a, a culture of accountability with costs, right? With the um, amazing ability to rapidly push to production and iterate, you know, with microservices and Kubernetes, um, it's hard to have this kind of, you know, just wait for say the finance team to review this at the end of the month or the end of the quarter. Um, we see this increasingly be, being viewed in real time by infrastructure teams, by engineering teams. Um, now, finance is still a very important stakeholder, um, and you know, absolutely has a very important like seat at the table in these conversations. But increasingly, these are again real time or near real time engineering decisions that are really uh, moving the needle on costs and cost efficiency over time and performance as well. Now, can you use this to model what costs might be? Or is this, or is this, you know, you, you mentioned monitoring in real time. Is this only for pulling information as it exists? Or could you do, could you use some of the aspects of, 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 of your tool set to make a decision whether something makes more sense to run on your existing infrastructure on, you know, on premises versus moving in a, you know, working in a cloud? Yeah. Is that something that it's designed for or, or not? Great question. So we do have the ability to predict cost. Cost um, going forward, uh, based on everything we've learned about your environment, whether you're multi-cloud, hybrid cloud, etc. Um, um, so, so uh, some some really interesting functionality there, and a lot more coming later this year, um, because we do see more and more teams wanting to model the state of the future, right? Um, as you deploy really complex uh, technologies like, say, the cluster auto scale or, or HPA in different environments, it can be really challenging to do an apples to apples comparison. And we help teams do exactly that. And again, going to have a lot more interesting announcements here uh, later this year. So later, th later this year, meaning not in the next few minutes while we're together? <laughs> uh, nothing new to announce on that front today, um, but um, I would say, you know, expect later this quarter for us to have more to, to share. Okay, that sounds good. Now, now you touched on this a little bit, but but I want to hone in on, on why this is particularly relevant now and moving into the future. You know, we've always, tracking costs has always been important, um, you know, even before the dawn of cloud, uh, but why is it increasingly important and, um, and you know there are there are alternatives for cost tracking, legacy alternatives that are out there. So talk about why it's particularly relevant now, and tell us what your superpower is. You know what's the all right, all right. You know, secret Excellent. secret sauce is something you can't share. Superpower you can talk about. It. <laughs> Absolutely, NDAable. So yes, so, yes. So why relevant? What's your superpower? Yeah, uh, great questions. Um, so first of all, just to, to to touch on what's fundamentally changing to make yeah a company like ours you know impactful or relevant. Uh, there's really three things here. Um, first and foremost is the the new abstractions or complexities that come with Kubernetes. Right, um, super powerful, but from a cost standpoint, make it considerably harder to accurately track costs. And the big transformation here is um, you know with Kubernetes, you can at any given moment have 50 applications running on a single node or a single VM. You can fast forward five minutes and there could be 50 entirely new applications, right? So just assigning that VM or you know, tagging that VM back to an application or team or department um, really is, is not relevant in most places. So just the new complexity related to cost makes this problem harder for teams. Um, Second is we touch on is just, again, the power of Kubernetes is the ability to uh, allow distributed you know, engineering teams to work on many microservices concurrently. So you're no longer in a lot of ways uh, managing this problem with a centralized, you know, kind of single point uh, of decision making. Oftentimes, these decisions are dis distributed across not only your infrastructure team but your engineering team. So, just the way these decisions and you know innovation is happening is changing how you manage these. And lastly, it's just scale, right? The the cloud and you know Kubernetes continue to be incredibly successful. Um, you know, we're as KubeCost now managing billions of dollars. Um, as these numbers get bigger and bigger, uh, just becomes more of a you know business focus and, and business critical issue. So those are the the you know the three kind of underlying themes that are changing. 
when I talk about what we do that makes us special, it's really this like foundational layer of visibility that we built. And what we can do is in real time with a very high degree of accuracy at the largest Kubernetes clusters in the world give you visibility at any dimension. And so from there, you can do things like have you know, real-time monitoring, you can have real-time insights, you can allow automation to make decisions on these um, you know, inputs or, or data feeds. You can set alerts, you can set recurring reports. Uh, all of these things are made possible because of um, you know, the, the, I would say, really hard work that we've done to, again, give this real-time visibility with a high degree of accuracy at, at crazy scale. So if we were to uh, play a little make-believe for a moment, pretend like I'm a skeptical, sitting on the fence, not sure if I want to go down this path kind of person. And I say, you know what, Webb? I think I have a really good handle on all of my costs so far. Uh, what would you hit me with as, as, as an example of something that people really didn't expect until they, <laughs> until they were running KubeCost and they ha actually had that visibility? What are some of the things that people are surprised by? Yeah, great question. There'd be a number. Uh, number one, I'd have you know, one data point I want to get from you, which is you know, for your organization or for all of your clusters, uh, what is your cost efficiency? Uh, can you answer that with a high degree of accuracy? And by cost and efficiency, the answer, and, the answer, and the answer is no. So tell me, <laughs> tell me, tell me how to sign up for Kubecost. Yeah, and so the I answer, continue, continue. Yeah, the answer there is you can go get our community version. You know, you can be up and running in minutes. You you know don't have to share any data, right? Like it is you know a, a simply a Helm install. Um, but um, cost efficiency uh, uh, is this notion of, of every dollar that you are spending on provision resources, what percentage of those dollars are you actually utilizing? And uh, we have, you know, we, we now have you know, thousands of teams using our product and we've worked with, you know, hundreds of them really closely. Um, it, you know, this is, uh, you know, that's not the entire market, but in our large, you know, sample sizes, we regularly see teams start in the like low 20% cost efficiency, meaning that approximately 80% is quote waste. Um, time and time again, uh, we see uh, teams just be shocked by this number. Um, and again, most of it is not because they were measuring it inaccurately or anything like that. Most teams, again, today still just don't have that visibility until they start working with us. So is that is that sort of uh, the, um, look, in my house uh, household, certain members seem to only believe that there is one position for a light switch and that would be the on position. Uh, is there, is this a bit of a parallel where, where folks are, um, are spinning up resources and then just out of sight, out of mind, maybe not spinning them down when not needed? Yeah, it's, it's, that's definitely one class of the challenges. Um, I would say, you know, so, so today, if you look at our product, we have 14 different insights across um, like different dimensions of your infrastructure. Um, one, uh, or, or I would say several of those relate to exactly what you just described, which is you spin up a VM, you spin up a load balancer, you spin up an external IP address, you're using it, you're not paying for it. Um, another class is this notion of, again, I don't have an understanding of what my resources cost. I also don't have a great sense for how much my microservice or application will need. So um, I'm just going to turn on all the light switches or I'm going to drastically over provision. Um, again, I don't know the cost, so I'm just going to kind of set it and forget it. Um, and if my application is performing, you know, then, you know, we're doing well here. Um, again, with this visibility, you can get much more specific, much more accurate, much more actionable with making that trade off. Um, you know, again, down to the individual pod workload, you know, deployment, et cetera. So we've, we've touched on this a bit peripherally, but give me an example. Um, you know, you, you run into someone who happens to be a happy user of, of KubeCost. What's the dream story that you love to hear from them about what life was before, was before KubeCost and what life was like after KubeCost? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, there's a lot, a lot of different dimensions there. Um, you know, one, uh, one is, you know, working with an infrastructure team that, that used to get asked these questions a lot about, you know, why does this cost so much? Or why are we spending this in Kubernetes? Or, or why are expenses growing the rate that they are? Um, you know, it, it, like when this, when this works, uh, you know, engineering teams or infrastructure teams aren't getting asked those questions, right? Uh, the tool, KubeCost itself is getting asked that and answering that. Um, so I think one is infrastructure teams not fielding those types of questions as much. Um, secondly, is just you know more and more teams rolling this out throughout their organization and ultimately just getting building a culture of awareness, like ownership, accountability. Um, and then you know we just increasingly are seeing teams um, you know find this right balance between you know cost and performance uh, again. So you know. In, in certain cases, improving performance when there are resource bottlenecks in places and other places, you know, reducing cost, um, you know, by 10 plus million dollars. Um, ultimately, at the end of the day, we like to see just teams being more comfortable running their workloads in Kubernetes, right? That is the ultimate sign of success is just an organization feels comfortable with how they are deploying, how they're managing, how they're spending. Um, in Kubernetes, again, whether that be, you know, on-prem or transitioning from on-prem to a cloud in multiple clouds, et cetera. So we're talking to you today as part of the second season of the uh, AWS Startup Showcase. What's what's the relationship there with uh, with AWS? So uh, it is, you know, the the largest platform for KubeCost being run today. Um, so I believe. Um, at this point, at least a thousand, you know, different organizations running our product on AWS uh, hosted clusters, whether they're, you know, EKS or, or self-managed, but you know, a, a growing number of those on, on EKS. Um, and, you know, we've just, you know, absolutely loved working with the team across, I think at this point, you know, six or seven different groups um, from marketplace to their containers team, um, you know, obviously, you know, EKS and, and others, um, and just very much see them, you know, continuing to push the boundaries on what's possible from a scale and, you know, ease of use um, and, you know, just breadth of, of offerings in this market. Well, we really look forward to having you back and hearing about some of these announcements, things that are, that are coming down the line. So we'll definitely have to touch base in the future, but, just one, one final, more general question for you. Um, where do you see Kubernetes in general going in 2022? Is it sort of uh, linear growth? Is there some? Is there an inflection point that we see? You know, a, a good percentage of software that's running enterprises right now is already in that open source uh, category. But what are your thoughts on Kubernetes in 2022? Yeah, I think um, you know the one word is everywhere is where I you know see Kubernetes in in 2022, um, like very deep in the like large and really complex enterprises, right? So I think you'll see just uh, you know major bets there. Um, I think you'll continue to see more engineers adopt it, and I think you'll also continue to see you know more and more flavors of it, right? So. You know, some teams find that running Kubernetes in a more serverless fashion is is right for them. Others find that you know having full control, uh, you know, at every part of the stack, um, including running their own auto scaler, for example, is really powerful. Um, so I think just you know you'll see more and more options, and again, I think teams increasingly adopting the right um, you know abstraction level on top of Kubernetes that works for their workloads and their organizations. Sounds good. We'll, we'll, we'll come back in uh, 2023 and we'll check and see how that, uh, how that all panned out. Well, uh, it's been great talking to you today as part of the startup showcase. Really appreciate it. Great to see you again. Uh, it's right about the time where I can still tell you happy new year uh, because we're still, we're still in January here. Hope you have a great 2022. Uh, with that, from me, Dave Nicholson, part of the Cube, part of AWS Startup Showcase season two. I'd like to thank everyone for joining and stay with us for the best in hybrid tech coverage.